We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up our hearts and minds to this knowledge that we are going to partake in. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts to what is righteous. And please, inshallah, let us stay as quiet as possible. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, to Him we belong and to Him we shall return. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom and in His infinite mercy to send peace and blessings upon our beloved Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi fil awaleen. Wa salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi fil akhireen. Wa salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi fil mala'i al-a'la ila yawm al-deen. اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا رب اشرح لنا صدورنا ويسر لنا أمورنا We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon our parents And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon our dear brothers and sisters Across the world who are facing great hardship Africa and Africa and China and the subcontinent and the Middle East Brothers and sisters who are facing great hardship, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the hardship from upon them and to have mercy upon them all. So last week we spoke about the social, political and economic conditions of the Arabian Peninsula. And alhamdulillah, I think we were able to extract some necessary lessons from those various factors. Today inshallah, we're going to be addressing primarily the religious condition or the religious state of affairs of the Arabian Peninsula because there is much to learn in that regard. So let us inshallah purify our intentions and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge. So we said that the story of the Arabian Peninsula, the Arabs that occupied the Arabian Peninsula start, started with Sayyidina who? Ismail, Zakallah khair. And so we know that Sayyidina Ibrahim and Sayyidina Ismail, they built the Kaaba. Zamzam occurred during this time, as well as As-Safa wal Marwa. These were three major sha'air or rituals that were recognized 3,000 years before the coming of the Prophet So the religion that the Arabian Peninsula is on for the large span of around 2,500 years is the religion of Sayyidina Ismail, the pure divine faith. From the time of Sayyidina Ismail, things begin to slowly progress towards a way, going away from divine faith. As time progresses, the centuries and centuries pass on, people begin to forget, people begin to neglect, and people move slowly and slowly away. Around 500 years before the coming of the Prophet wasallam, probably one of the more devastating things happens in the Arabian Peninsula. A man by the name of Amr ibn Luhay al-Khuza'i from the Qabila of Khuza'a. He's on a business trip. He's a businessman. He's a very recognized businessman. He's from the noble elite of the Qurashi society. He is very well regarded, very well respected. And on one of his business trips to Syria, he goes and he sees the people of Syria worshipping these idols. And he becomes enamored by them. And he asks them, what is this thing that you guys are doing? They say, oh, these idols, they give us, they get us directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we are not, befit, we can't go directly to Allah, we're nothing. We're low, we're full of sins. So these idols, they take us to Allah. So he becomes enamored by this concept. And he decides to take an idol from Syria back with him to Mecca. And this is the first introduction of any type of idol worship into the Arabian Peninsula. This is exactly around four to 500 years before the coming of the Prophet Wasallam. The first time an idol is introduced into the Arabian Peninsula. And when he brings it to Mecca, clearly the Arabs come and they see this, and they are dumbfounded. They're asking themselves, what is this? Amr ibn Luhay tells them that this is someone who can, these idols are think this idol by the name of Hubal, he brings the, the grand Hubal, you know, after Ghazwat Uhud where the Mushrikeen said, U'lu Hubal. That story, this is that Hubal, the first idol to be brought into the Arabian Peninsula. 
So he tells them, listen, you go to this idol if you want any connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're, they're thirsty. And they say, really? Yes. So they go. And as the Arabs are coming into the region, they're coming and they're seeing this new concept, this new idea. And everyone starts to want their own idol. Alright, so you guys have Ghubal here. Well, we come from Yathrib. We want our own idol in Yathrib. And so, al aws wal Khazraj, they set up their own idol, known as Manat. Right? You know in Surah Al-Najm, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةَ وَمَنَاتَ الثَّالِثَةَ الْأُخْرَى These three idols, these are the first idols that are established in the region after Hubal. So Manat is set up near uh, Yathrib. And Allat is set up near al taif And al uzza is set up near a place called Wadi al nakhla Now, what's interesting to understand is that the Arabs believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They believed in Allah, but they felt that they needed an intercessor, intercessor to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah in the Quran tells us, مَنْ عَبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَ The only reason we worship these idols is to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَإِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَكُمْ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask them, who created you? They would say Allah. So they understand the idea of a creator. But their perversion in understanding of the reality of their creator was slowly declining. So this idol was a new, fresh idea, a new concept that they believed they could utilize to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so every qabila begins to now come, see what's happening, and they go and they start building their own idols in their own locations. And this became rampant. Every single tribe, every single qabila would set up their own idol. This system of idol development or idol worship started to grow and grow and grow. To the extent that people would now start having their own idols at home. So no longer do I have to go to the Kaaba. I'm at home and I want to get spiritual. So what do I do? I get my little portable idol. This is my little satellite situ- region where I can worship Allah. I can go get closer to these bigger idols in Mecca by worshiping my little idol here. On their travels, they would begin to take their own idols. And a man by the name of um, Abu Raja al-Mutaridi, when he would travel, he would see a big stone and he would become enamored by the stone. He'd say, you know what, this is my idol today. And if he would continue, he would see, oh wait, hold on, this stone is much nicer. I'm actually going to worship this stone. And if he didn't see any major stones, what he would do was he would gather some dirt and he would have his goat, he would milk his goat on that dirt until that dirt would become hardened and he would begin to worship that little mound of dirt. Or if none of that existed, they would make idols out of sweets. You know, there's a story that's narrated about Sayyidina Umar. They disagree about its authenticity, but nonetheless it's meaningful in this regard. That Sayyidina Umar one time was crying and then he was laughing. And they said, why, what made you cry? And he mentioned a story about burying his daughter. And then they said, what made you laugh? He said, I, I recall a time when we were traveling and I needed to worship. So I took whatever dates that I had and I put it together and I started to worship the dates. And then he's like, at night I became hungry. So I decided to eat my idol. And then later on I thought about it, I had to pass my idol through in the bathroom. And the Sahaba interestingly enough asked him, did you guys, he asked Sayyidina Umar, you didn't have uqul? You didn't have minds? He said, no, 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 we had minds, but we had no hidayah, we had no guidance. Subhanallah. One of the saddest, funniest, the Arab would say, mudhikun mubki, in the sense of it's so ridiculous that it makes you laugh and cry simultaneously, is the story of a man from, a man and woman from Yemen. And they come to the Kaaba, and they engage in illicit behavior in front of the Kaaba. 
And because of Allah Azza's anger with them, he turns them into stone. And the people of Mecca knew this story. They knew that this occurred to uh, um, what's their name? Uh, Isaf and Naila. Isaf and Naila. Isaf and Naila came, they had relations in front of the Kaaba, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns them into stone. And so the people had become familiar with this story. What they did was they took Isaf and they put him on Mount Safa. And they took Naila and they put her on Mount Marwa. And they started to worship them. The perversion of their thought process was rampant. They began to slowly think mindlessly. This is a stone. Oh, this must be special. I'm going to start worshiping this stone. Now, the question that I have for us is when we think about the arbitrariness and the pervertedness of their worship, that they had these idols that became everything to them. They were obsessed with their idols. Their lives revolved around their idols. The question that I have for us is, are we not similar in the establishment of our own idols? Have we not in our own right taken idols for ourselves? And I want us to seriously think about our dependence upon TV and movies and music and entertainment. I'm not going to even touch the halal haram aspect of things. Forget about that for a side. Let's put that aside for a moment. I'm just speaking, and, for, and let's put aside the functional aspect. We may say, well, I need this for my school or whatever. Let's put that aside. So, so halal haram, let's put it aside. Functional, let's put it aside. I want us to think about our psychological, emotional, and even spiritual dependence upon these things. Think about the fact that if we're, when we're going traveling, you know, the Abu Raja al-Mutaridi, he needed his idol with him wherever he was going. And no matter what, he had to have his idol present with him for his spiritual nourishment. When we go on our own travels, do we not have to have downloaded a playlist of music, or a list of movies, or entire series or season of I don't know what show, or that series on HBO or whatever? And then if I don't do this, then my trip is going to be miserable, and I'm going to find myself lost, and not knowing what to do with my time, I'm going to get bored. This concept of being bored is so terrifying. W what am I going to do with my senses if I'm not engaging them through watching something or listening to something? In many ways, brothers and sisters, we have turned into idols these aspects of our life. The simple fact that we find joy in entertainment when we watch something that is clearly impermissible on TV or on the internet. And everyone knows what they watch at night or in the day. Everyone knows what they look at, what their eyes touch on the TV. The fact that not only do we know this is inappropriate, but we become dependent upon these things. That I need to watch these things. If I don't watch it, I'm not comfortable. You know, think about people who engage in very illicit behavior on the internet. They start off in the beginning, and it's a one-off thing. Maybe I'll just watch this one thing. Okay, it's not full, I won't do it again. And then one turns into two, turns into three, and I become obsessed by this thing. And this thing begins to motivate what I do, and when I do it. And I'll actually begin to organize my schedule around that specific thing watching this show, or watching this thing on the internet. Is this not a form of idolization? That we become supremely obsessed with these things? You know, brothers and sisters, there are so many forms of major and minor shirk that we engage in in society today. A lot of people, when they think about the Arabs and this kind of idol worship, they think of the religious people of today. Oh, it's the religious people who engage in this kind of mindless behavior. This idol worship and these kind of superstitious things and I don't know what, finding value in a magic, whatever. That's what religious people do. But the secular mind does not fall into those traps. The secular mind is free. This is what people claim. 
But is that really the case? You know, my wife was telling me about a boy band group who, when one of the artists in the band told his followers, I don't eat with a spoon, suddenly all of his followers are not eating with spoons because their, their leader, this boy band whatever, is telling them, I don't like to eat with spoons. Think about the idea of American Idol, an Arab Idol, an Indian Idol. This concept of obsessing over the idealization of people. We have become obsessed with superstars. We become obsessed with knowing that this person is doing what? And what kind of dress are they wearing? And where are they going? And what kind of car are they driving? We're obsessed with the ultra-wealthy. If there's one thing that our society is about, it's the obsession of consumerism and capitalism. The dollar is an ilah in our country. The dollar is an ilah all over the world. And so we'd be obsessed with it. We know everything about our billionaires. How many billionaires we have? How many millionaires we have? What kind of mansions they live in? What kind of cars they drive? Does not this become our ultimate obsession? Is this not a form of idol worship? Now, of course, I don't think people go and say, you know, we don't worship, you know, this dollar to get us close to Allah. But I think it's actually worse than that. We mentioned last time that in the Arabian Peninsula, commerce and the idols that surrounded the Mecca, the Kaaba, were absolutely intimately related. And we said how the 360 idols that surrounded the Kaaba, they represented the, the, um, the, the Qabail, the tribes, from surrounding regions. And it was a way for them to protect their trade routes. But there's another thing that started to occur in the Kaaba as well. The idol business became a big deal. So now people are recognizing that everyone likes to have their little personalized idol. So let's set up an idol marketplace around the Kaaba. And people would come and they could buy their own little miniature, miniature idols. If we think and consider our dependence and our obsession with the dollar, our obsession with the financial markets, our obsession with Wall Street, and how everything that really motivates us is to what extent I'm really wealthy or not. Do I have um, upward mobility? We have given the dollar inherent value, as if the dollar in and of itself is meaningful. And that's ultimately what the tribes, the, the Qabail did, these Arabs did. Initially, yes, the idols were something to get them closer to Allah. But then the idols started to have value in and of itself. So we like to convince ourselves that, yeah, yeah, no, I want money so I can do very noble causes. And I want to do very noble things. And inshallah, that's our intention. But realistically speaking, for how many of us is that really the case? For how many of us is it really about, I just want the next bigger and better thing? I want the nice car, I want the bigger home, I want a bigger paycheck. And I'm willing to sacrifice my values and my principles to get that. And this is where it becomes extremely dangerous. So let us be mindful of this as we're assessing the idols that we have developed in our own lives. So now back to the Arabs. The Arabs had become completely disconnected and had gone completely astray from divine guidance. So much so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He references the Arabs in the Quran, He would say, قَوْمًا مَا أُنذِرَ آبَاؤُهُمْ فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ A people whose fathers, whose forefathers were not warned. So they are heedless and mindless. They were so engrossed in their activities and their behaviors and they had become so disconnected from the deen of Ismail alayhi salam that when Allah describes them, He describes them that people have not been warned. Now they had completely become disconnected. And they started to engage in very, let's call it bizarre, in arbitrary ways of sacredness. So for example, when they came to make tawaf around the Kaaba, they would do it naked. They would do the tawaf naked because they thought this was the purest thing that I could do. 
the purest thing that I could do is make tawaf around the Kaaba naked. They became extremely superstitious people. And the root of this superstition was that man Amr ibn Luhay. This concept of tatayur became rampant. And tatayur was simply that you would walk out in the morning and you would think, okay, what should I do today? The birds are going this way. All right, the birds are going in the right direction. That's the way I'm going to go. The birds are going left. I should stay away from it. That was the arbitrariness of it. The shooting of arrows to decide what you're going to do. And one of the most famous stories in this regard is Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're going to touch the story when we speak about Amul Fil, the year of the Prophet's birth, inshallah, when we get to it, not today. But when he, he made a nadr, he made a promise, and he told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I will slaughter one of my boys. He, made, he kept this private because if the Arabs knew that he was promising to slaughter one of his boys, this was going to be a big problem. So he promised Allah, he said, if you give me 10 boys, I will slaughter one of them as a sacrifice to you, as a qurba to you. And as we would have it, he had 10 boys. And so to choose the boy that he was going to slaughter, he put all of their names and arrows, and he picked one. And the one that was chosen was Abdullah, the father of Muhammad The story is long, but what ultimately ends up happening is where he tells the people of Quraysh, this is what has happened, and they go crazy. You cannot slaughter a boy. Slaughter a girl, go ahead. But a boy, no. And they made a big hoopla around this and they decided we have to take you to a kahin. Someone who can figure this out for us. So they take him to a sorcerer, they sit down and they discuss it and they come up with a solution. And the solution was ultimately that they would slaughter hundreds and hundreds of camels. But the point is that someone like Abdul Muttalib the grandfather of the Prophet, who was a wise man, he was not a simple man, but even he was engaged in this kind of activity. Even he was engaged in this kind of arbitrariness. No one was safe, except a few, and we'll get to that shortly, inshallah. Sayyidina Umar said, we had minds, yes, we had intellects, but we had no guidance. Abdul Muttalib was a genius, but no guidance just mindlessly adopting what was given to him. This is what we found our fathers and our forefathers doing. So we adopt it. We do it. Everyone else is doing it. Why don't I do it as well? It seems to be working for others. It must work for me. Is that not the logic that is rampant? Not only in their society clearly, but very much so in our times today? We'll get to that shortly, inshallah. Another sign of their arbitrariness, which was really to me unbelievable. I'm sure you hear in the Quran the, the word nasiyah. That nasi is an increase in disbelief in kufr. What nasi is, this concept in the Quran, is what the Arabs would do was if they, now the Arabs believed in the sacred months. And the sacred months, there was no warring. There was no wars. You could not war. That's it. It was impossible. So you would have two warring tribes, and they were recognizing that the trade months were coming. The months of trade were coming. And so what they decided to do would say, okay, okay, okay. We're going to move this month up, push that month over there, bring this one there, so that we can take care of our trade routes, because, you know, the dollar is king. And then we'll switch the months around so that we'll continue the battling after the sacred months are now over. Everything is good. We took care of the problem. We'll stop fighting for now. We brought the sacred months up. We'll continue later on. Subhanallah. Remarkable arbitrariness. And one of the profound things that really if you go and look at the verse of Surah Al-Ilaf uh, Quraysh, the verses of Al-Ilaf Quraysh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because you can see that that money really motivated them so much so that they were going to switch their sacred months around and so on and so forth. 
When Allah speaks to Quraysh in that surah, what does He say? Li ilafi Quraysh. Ilafihim. Ilaf is from ulfa. It's from bringing comfort to you, from bringing, bringing comfort and, 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 and relaxation to you. Li ilafi Quraysh ilafihim. Rihla tu shita'i wa saif. The rihla of shita'i wa saif was their main trade season. And so what Allah is telling them, we've brought comfort to you. And we've given you this rihla of shita'i wa saif. فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ We are the ones, Allah is now in the Quran, when He comes to speak to them, you guys save so much honor to the dollar, we're the ones who gave you shita'i wa saif, Allah is saying. فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَأَمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ the Lord of this home who gave you your, your food and who, who kept you safe. So Allah was shifting the paradigm for them. These things are not arbitrary. There is a source for what is happening. There is a source for your sustenance. There is a source for your food. There is a source for your safety. So brothers and sisters, what we see happening in the Arabian Peninsula is this slow moral decline. From divine faith to absolute arbitrary sacredness. What I feel is sacred becomes sacred. Idols become meaningful. Idols become the obsession of their existence. What we have to understand is that perversion in faith and perversion in belief is a slow process. It can start off small, but it like a cancer will grow and grow and grow until it completely consumes. So what are some of the key lessons to be learned in this regard? Number one, what happened to the Arabs is the direct result of their humanness. The Arabs are human beings. And what happened to them will and can and does happen to any Arab, any human being. And all throughout history we see this occurring. Allah is making it very clear to us. Look at the Arabs and look how they moved away from divine guidance. If you are not careful and if you do not hold on to the divine guidance that has been given to you by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that will be your end result. We laugh at them now. We sit here and laugh at the Arabs of those times and their idols and their arbitrariness and their nasi and their moving around of the months and their tatayur. But if we're not careful, what happened to them will absolutely happen to us. And in some ways, it already has begun to happen. The second is the slow, like I mentioned earlier, the slow process of altering and changing and perverting the deen. Brothers and sisters, this point is absolutely crucial in our time. In our day and age, as Muslims in America, especially as Muslims in the minority sense, that we're a minority community. And we are in this country, born and raised, many of us, some of us immigrated, that is completely overwhelming. There is this world, you know, dominance that exists of the capital market and various other isms, scientism and so on. Living in this world, we feel, we feel pressed to begin to slowly alter parts of our deen to conform to society. Because this is what is dominant and prevalent in society, we begin to slowly alter parts of our deen. And many a times this is done with a good intention. We think that we're doing a good thing. You know, I'll be very honest. There are people that I know of who will say things like this to me. They'll say, you know, I'm in the corporate world. And we as a Muslim community, we need to be strong. And we have to become financially independent. Agreed. We have to become financially strong. Agreed. And so, under the guise of becoming financially independent and financially strong, we'll begin to engage in acts and start to invest in things and go and be involved in financial tools that are definitely questionable, that shiyukh may tell you this is haram, but you'll tell yourself, no, 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 no. These shiyukh, they don't know what they're talking about. Yes, at times shiyukh are, can, there is a problem at times being disconnected. 
But if you're at work, and you know, for example, that you've asked five shiuch, and they've all told you that you cannot go to this party, it's unacceptable. But you're thinking to yourself, I know what's good for me. And if I don't go to this party, it's going to look really bad. And it's going to definitely hinder my career. And so what do I decide to do? I'll say, listen, I know you said it's wrong, but I have to go anyway. Because I know what's good for me. Or, you'll say something like this. We'll say something like, I know it's wrong, but I'm sorry, I gotta go. One will completely just push whatever the sheikh may say aside and say, you know what, the sheikh is backwards, disconnected, he's from some other land, I don't know what, they're in some other la-la land. And so I completely deem their opinion as irrelevant. Or, I may feel guilty, but I'll do it anyway. How profoundly powerful is that? When we have guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with guidance. He has blessed us with the Qur'an and the Sunnah and scholars. We have wonderful scholars in our own community. We have all of these blessings from Allah, all of these beautiful virtues from Allah, but we decide to follow ourselves. Have you not seen those who have taken as their ilah, their hawa, their whims? This is what Allah says in the Quran. There are people who take their own whims as ilah. Is this not precisely what we are doing? When I completely push aside all of the scholarly opinions and I say I'm going to do what I think is right. But sometimes it gets even worse than that. Forget about having a scholarly opinion. Forget about the idea that, hold on, I'm, I have a bigger, you know, better goal in mind, so I may do some bad things. But there are people who just engage in full-out haram without having any care. La mubala. And this is one of the most dangerous states that we can be in. That not only do we, dis we do not care about the guidance that has been given to us from the Qur'an and Sunnah and from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we find tremendous pleasure and joy in doing things that are clearly haram and illicit, infractions against the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be very careful of this. The other lesson that we have to be very mindful of is this idea of هَذَا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ أَبَاوْنَا this is what we see and we have seen our fathers and our forefathers doing. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of cultural aspects that we introduce into the deen that have nothing to do with the deen. And that doesn't mean that anything that has come from overseas, from Egypt or from Syria or Palestine or Bangladesh or India is bad. Absolutely not. Much of what we've inherited from our cultures, from our fathers and our parents, especially the young immigrant community's parents, much of it is good. But some of it is definitely not good. There are parts of it that are devastating to families, devastating to young people, that completely destroy the future of a lot of young men and women. And so it is not enough to say that, hold on, this is all that I know. This is what I saw my parents doing back home. Or even, or better yet, this is what I see people doing here today. My idols, the people that I really look up to, this is what they do, so it must be right. You know, this is what Bill Gates has done to achieve the success that he has succeeded, so I'm going to do the same thing. Is, is Bill Gates, yes, we'll appreciate what he's accomplished, fine. But is he my idol by any stretch of the imagination? No. I'll simply see an actor dressing a certain way and I will dress exactly like that actor because that's who I look up to. This is what people are doing. This is what's popular. This is what pop culture is doing. This is what's in. You know, to look cool, you have to dress this very specific way. We have hipsters now, maybe in a few decades, maybe in a few years from now, we'll have some other form of pop cultural movement that everyone just follows suit. What Islam requires and what we learn from the Arabian Peninsula is this idea of the critical faculty. Being critical. Not saying, This is what we see people doing, so we do it. This is one key aspect of our lives that has to be altered. 
And lastly, one of the lessons that we learned before we move on to the next section is the fact, and this is very important, that the masses, generally speaking, are easily motivated and easily moved. Amr ibn Luhay, he brings into the Arabian Peninsula an idol, and within the span of decades and years, everyone is obsessed with idols. Brothers and sisters, never follow the masses. Never look at the masses. We see in the world today, in various parts of the world, mass hysteria. Millions of people who've almost literally lost their minds. This is something that we have to be very careful of. I'm not saying that whatever the mass is doing is wrong. But we have to be critical. Not just because everyone is doing it, that it then it's okay. And that's why Allah tells us, وَمَا أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتَ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ When He's telling the Prophet, most people, even if you try so hard, will not be believers. Because nine times out of ten, the human, the person, will follow their whim. So, now, we've outlined how the Arabian Peninsula was, and it seems that everyone was involved in this idol worship and this arbitrariness. But in all of this, there was, I would say, a bright light. A group of people, and they are, the ulama say roughly around seven, who for me are a massive source of inspiration. These were a group of people who lived during those times before the coming of the Prophet wasallam. They were known as Hunafa. They were people, the last remaining, literally six or seven people, who were the last people who were on the deen of Ibrahim and Ismail. And the way in which they maintained their belief was by never imprisoning their minds. They always stayed free up here. They looked at what the Arabs were doing and they said, there's no way this is right. It's mindless to be bowing to an idol, completely wrong. Why am I going to a stone and sacrificing a sheep for this idol? It's mindless. Some of these names are Waraq ibn Nawfal, the cousin of Sayyidah Khadija. And we're going to hear about him, inshallah, when we speak about the Prophet Sallallahu the receiving of the wah. Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, who was the Prophet's cousin. Uthman ibn Huwaydith. And the one that I really want us to focus on today is a man by the name of Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. And this man was the cousin of Umar radiallahu anhu, Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he was the father of the great Sahabi, Sa'id ibn Zayd. Now Zayd ibn Amr, he rejected all of the practices of Quraysh. And even before the coming of the Prophet, he would go to the Kaaba, and he would stand in front of the Kaaba, and he would yell at the people of Quraysh. And he would tell them, what you're doing is wrong. And this idol worshipping that you're doing, it's completely mindless. You cannot do it any longer. You must stop this behavior. It has nothing to do with the pure deen that we have inherited from our forefathers. He would also, if he saw people who were about to slaughter or kill their daughters, the female infanticide, he would run to those people and he would beg and plead with them not to kill their daughters. And he would tell them, please, please do not do this. It's, mi it's mindless. Do not do it. Absolutely not. And if they didn't turn away, he would say, okay, please give me your daughter and I will, in I will adopt her. SubhanAllah, this man existed in the, in the trenches of shirk that had become rampant in Mecca and in that surrounding region. And he ended up adopting so many young girls because he wanted to protect them from that mindless behavior. Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl was asked, the Sa Sa'id ibn Zayd, his son, asked the Prophet wasallam about his father, Zayd ibn Amr. And he said, what is the state of my father's condition? My father died, he died five years before the coming of the revelation. And so Zaid ibn Zayd was scared. He said, my father died before the revelation, what's his state? 
The Prophet ﷺ said, I saw him in Jannah. Zayd ibn Amr ibn Dufayr was an ummah by himself. Allahu Akbar. A man who independently was an ummah. What this tells us, brothers and sisters, is that the truth is something that we can always attain. If we are sincere enough and we keep our faculty, of into our intellectual faculties free of any type of obfuscation, we stay clear on our purpose, we don't allow our whims and desires and what the masses are doing or what's popular to overwhelm us, and we're sincere enough, Allah will protect us. You know, the story of Salman al-Farisi, which we'll get into in the seerah, is remarkably beautiful. A man who started, and I mentioned this in our khutbah today, a man who started in Persia, okay, he started in Persia and he was the son of the person who was responsible with keeping the eternal flame lit. And he kept the eternal flame lit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because this man, uh, Salman al farisi was sincere, he would guide. He would guide him to that next step that was required for him to get closer and closer to righteousness. In his pathways back and forth, going to his father where he was lighting the fire, he bumped into a rahib, a monk, a Jewish monk, who guided him to a certain understanding that this fire worshipping, it's mindless. It's not something we do. And then the list goes on, and we'll get into the story, but he goes and he's sold into slavery from Syria. And his slavery route takes him where? Into Medina. He starts off as a fire worshipper in Persia. And by divine decree, he ends up as a slave in Medina. And as a slave in Medina, he begins to hear some of what he had heard from that monk about the coming of a prophet by the name of Muhammad. And they begin to hear this description. And he runs to go and see this man. And this monk had told Salman al farisi about the signs of this man being a prophet. And so Salman would go to the Prophet wasallam, and he would want to do anything to see the seal of prophethood on his back. And he would go and look and the Prophet knew exactly what he was looking for. And so the Prophet said, relax, relax. <laughs> he didn't say relax, relax. But I said that. And he would take, he took down his garment and he showed the Prophet sallallahu he showed Salman the seal of prophethood. His rahib, his monk had told him that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam does not accept gifts. And so he went to the Prophet and he slid him some gifts. And the Prophet gathered the Sahaba and he said, take from your brother's gifts, I don't take. And so Salman ultimately believed in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But what this story illustrates and what the story of Amr ibn Nufayl illustrates is the power of seeking truth. The power of seeking truth and being absolutely sincere in that pursuit. And recognizing that no matter what we do, no matter what we try, everything must be done sincerely. And whatever that truth ends up telling me, I'm going to submit to it. And so if I am sincere in my submission to Allah and His Messenger, and I go to a trustworthy shaykh, and the shaykh says, this is haram, you say, I believe. Samat wa taat. I will not do this, it's haram. I know that everything in my mind tells me that this is the right thing, and this is good, or this is beneficial for my life, but because it's haram, I'm going to completely stay away from it, and inshallah, Allah will replace it with much, much better things. And I'll close with this. Today in the khutbah we spoke about Malcolm X. And although Malcolm X was not in the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, but he is definitely someone that I think we should all remember. And especially in this idea of following and pursuing truth no matter wherever it is, Malcolm X was a man who had raised very high in the ranks of the Muslim in the nation of Islam. But when he realized that what he was following in the nation of Islam was wrong in 1964, one year before he was killed, he sacrificed all of it. 
He sacrificed all that he had, all of that development, all that growth he had had in the nation. He took the nation from a 400 member organization to a 40,000 member organization. You can claim that he single handedly did that. And he gave everything to the nation of Islam because he was convinced that that was the truth. But when he realized that the truth was no longer in the nation, he handed in his resignation. That is a man of honor, a man of truth, a man of sincerity. That is the prophetic virtue that we want to imbibe in ourselves. We want to be people of truth. If people don't see this in us, if people don't see divine guidance, the Qur'an and Sunnah, and the way of the Prophet ﷺ in us, in these faces here today, then who are they to see it in? If I have my own set of idols, in my own set of arbitrary beliefs and likes and dislikes, then what kind of example am I really for this society? What kind of example am I for my children? These are the critical questions that we have to ask ourselves, inshaAllah ta'ala. So with that, today we'll close a little bit early because I see that the faces are uh, getting a little bit tired. So inshaAllah, we'll close here and we'll continue next week. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to open up our hearts to righteousness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who love truth and love honor and love dignity. Make us of those who are steadfast on His path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who love Iman and Islam and make us of those who hate kufr and fusuq and isyan. O oh Allah, make beloved to our hearts righteousness and make hated to our hearts sin and disbelief. The Prophet wasallam, one of the most common ad'iyah that he would make was Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O oh Allah, the one who can, trans can transform the state of the heart, make my heart steadfast on your deen. Brothers and sisters, never take your deen for granted. The slow decline that occurred in the Arabian Peninsula is because many began to take their deen for granted. My deen is a given. But one of the signs of the end of the times is that the person can wake up a Muslim and go to bed a kafir. Never be confident that your deen is something that is set in stone. In a moment's notice, your deen can be stripped of you. How? Allahu alam. But it can definitely happen. Sayyidina Abu Bakr would say, Wallahi, even if my right leg was in Jannah, I would not be confident that my, leg would, my left leg would follow. The, one of the great diseases of the heart is this idea of tul amal. That someday I'll change and someday I will transform. Insha'Allah I will put on my hijab when the time is right. I will start to fast and pray and pray fajr on time when the time is right. That is one of the biggest deceptions of the shaitan. If you're not doing it today, know that in that future time when you think you're going to do it, it's only going to be 20 times harder. Let us not be deceived by the shaitan. Let us protect ourselves from the shaitan. Let us seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from ever falling into kufr. We seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from ever falling into disbelief. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our, heart, our hearts steadfast on belief, steadfast, steadfast on iman and Islam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us with our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the highest of heights in the firdaus al-a'la min al-jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And with that, inshallah, if there's anyone who has any questions, um, please, if you want to write them and send them up, don't be embarrassed. Keep it anonymous if you have any questions or doubts or thoughts about what we've said. And, um, or you can speak up, inshallah, if you'd like. If you're, you know, if you're courageous enough, go ahead. Zakhmullah. Salam alaikum. Does anybody have any questions? We don't have the microphone today, so you raise your hand, I'll try to hear you my best. Assalamu alaikum. So I'm going to ask Ishaq during the question and answer session if you're going to leave, which is perfectly fine, that you get up quietly and leave quietly. 
And if you're going to meet some of your friends and your brothers and sisters, tell us discuss what you need to discuss outside. So, okay. so the brother is asking a very good question. He's saying that one of the ways in which the people of that time started to engage in idol worship is by the fact that they didn't have free minds. Now, I said many things, and one of the things that I said was this concept of that their minds had become in submission to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what I mean is that as they slowly started to move away from the guidance that was given to them, and they started to slowly follow their own whims and their desires, rather than the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did Sayyidina Umar tell the Sahaba, it's not that we didn't have minds, but we didn't have guidance. Because guidance is the only thing that can preserve the mind of the human being. If you want to use your mind in a meaningful way, in, in a blessed way, it is only by following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, when they moved away from the guidance of Allah, and they started to file, follow the guidance of people like Amr ibn Luhay, who was this dynamic figure, and they started to listen to him, and they started to follow their own desires and whims, then their minds became submitted to other than Allah. You know, Banu Israel, one of their biggest problems, you know, they saw with their own eyes some of the greatest miracles. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They saw this happening and they saw Fir'aun drowning. Sisters, sisters, please. This is the, the brothers asking a very important question. And this, this is not a time for talking. So if you want to speak, please either go outside. If we're going to stay in the main hall, we stay quiet. Zakumullah khair. So they saw the drowning of Fir'aun and they saw the parting of the Red Sea. When they passed, what did they ask for? You know what they asked for? They told Sayyidina Musa that we want... Aliha. We want idols like these people have idols. They're worshipping cows and whatever, we want the same thing. What makes a people who had, had literally just experienced a miraculous event like the parting of the Red Sea ask for idols? That's when the mind becomes completely in submission to other than Allah. They were completely in submission to Fir'aun and to their selves and various other things. So you want to keep your mind free and you want to keep your mind pure? Submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَنْ تَوَاضَعَ لِلَّهِ رَفَعَهُ Whomsoever humbles themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will uplift them. Jazakallah khair. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I think it's a good question. The brother is asking, why as human beings do we have this desire to follow and find role models? It's a very good question. And all I could do is really uh, theorize. I don't have an, an absolute answer to that. But what I would say is this. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put it in us that we have a desire as human beings to attach ourselves to things. Attach ourselves to an ilah. You know, look at the Arabs. There was clearly something that was needed in their lives. They had this natural desire. Something needed to be nourished. Something needed to be fulfilled. And so when they saw these idols, they latched onto it. That vacuum, whatever it is within us, it needs to be filled with that which is righteous. So we all have these vacuums, we have these needs. This is a human tendency, this is human nature. The reason, Allahu A'la. But that clearly is the case. And so, if you don't fill it with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala and His Messenger, it will absolutely be filled by something else. So if you don't fill it, if you don't fill it with Allah and His Messenger, then you'll fill it by a superstar. You'll fill it by a boy band. You'll fill it by, I don't know who else, by Steve Jobs. Any other major figure will say, okay, that's who I look up to because this is who I respect. That person did great things. So all I could say really is that there is, this is a part of our human nature and there is this void that needs to be filled and if we don't fill it with meaningful things, then something will definitely devastate us. You know, 
not to bring up these kind of examples, but so often you see all of these stars, Hollywood superstars or whatever, dying from addiction, suicide. And it's just, I mean, even people that I would think to myself, this person really, even this person died from cocaine or whatever? But what does that tell you? These are people who had seemingly everything, but they filled that void with nothing. And so ultimately overtook them. So I'll look more into your question, inshallah, but I would definitely say that we have to fill our voids with that which is proper and righteous, inshallah. Thank you.